18 years ago, I received one of those phone calls that is every parent's nightmare. Our son had dived into a pool and was instantly paralyzed from the shoulders down. To say that all our lives changed would be putting it mildly. That thing I say at the end of every video, the most creative solutions and the best stories begin with the biggest challenges, I know it's true. In today's video, I'll be sharing some amazingly creative solutions and introducing you to our son, Daniel. According to the CDC, 26% of Americans have some type of disability and one in seven adults has a mobility issue. Statistics say you or someone close to you will experience a disability. I'm not exaggerating when I say that good design is life-changing. If you think this doesn't apply to you, please keep listening. The designs I will be showing you fit into three broad categories, accessibility, age in place, and visitability. I've tried to clearly mark chapters so you can jump to the topics that you're interested in. I recommend that everyone watch the chapters on bathroom modification, utilizing accessible technology you might already have, and paying for accessible modifications. Those are areas everyone should know about because they can save you expense and trouble in the future. If needs suddenly change, you just might remember there is a solution. And if you're interested in creating a stylish accessible home that doesn't look like assisted living chic, check out the Pottery Barn chapter or click on the link in the description. I'm going to start with visitability, a word that might be new to you. Essentially, the idea is to make your home accessible to people with limited mobility. There are three simple components. First, a zero step entrance. Next, doors with 32 inches of clear passage space, and lastly, one bathroom on the main floor you can get into in a wheelchair. The zero step entrance can be a secondary entrance. It doesn't have to be the front door. My son uses his back door. In our previous home, we used the door from the garage. If you plan on making a permanent modification, just remember the rule. For every inch of rise, you'll need one foot of run. That's about a five degree slope. If you have a six inch step, you need a six foot ramp. In our family, we also use portable ramps that can be purchased, rented, or constructed for temporary use with visitors. Don't tell anyone I told you this, but if there are people around to push the wheelchair, you can get away with a much steeper angle. People in wheelchairs don't get invited into other people's homes very often. Even an imperfect situation is better than being excluded. Exterior doors are required by code to be 34 inches wide. The doorway to keep in mind is the bathroom door. Having a main floor bathroom makes it possible for anyone who struggles with stairs to confidently visit. If you already have a main floor bathroom but the doorway is, say, 30 inches, an inexpensive workaround is an offset hinge. I put a link in the description. By removing the door protrusion, you can easily gain an extra one to two inches. A pocket door is another solution, but more complicated. The most challenging aspect of the bathroom is making it large enough for a wheelchair to get in and turn around. 
an area approximately five by five. But in my experience, the wheelchair accessible entrance is so welcoming. All other failings are forgiven, even a burnt dinner. That's all it takes to be visitable. There is a happy trend to build new communities where all the houses are visitable. When my son Daniel was in grad school, he lived in a newer townhome style apartment where all the units had at least one door with a zero step entrance. I cannot begin to describe what a blessing that was. If you have connections to new construction, I encourage you to make new builds visitable or mention the option to the people who make decisions. The cost in dollars is negligible at initial construction and priceless in the long run. I will just tell you from this side of 60, aging happens much faster than you expect. However old you are now, it's the time to plan for aging in place, unless you just want to live in assisted living. The logical place to start for age in place is the same as visitability, a zero step entrance, wider doorways, and a main level bathroom. All you have to add is a main level bedroom, and you have single level living. You have those four things this will be easy. When we remodeled our home six years ago, our goals were visitability and age in place for ourselves and my parents who were both in their late 80s at the time we began the remodel. My father passed away during that period and my mother moved in with us five months after we finished. It was such a blessing to have her with us for the last three years of her life. A quick look at our remodel includes the ramp constructed of pavers with a lip to help define the edge since we do not have handrails. I added some tall pot plants for purely aesthetic reasons, but my son likes the way they visually define the curves without him having to look down. In our video exterior makeover, linked below, I share how handy a zero step entrance is. About 36 million falls are reported among older adults each year, resulting in more than 32,000 deaths. And up to 80% of falls occur in the bathroom. Grab bars in the shower and next to the toilet make it safer as people age. A little forethought during a bathroom remodel can save lots of money in the future. Simply adding extra wood during the framing process makes it easy to put grab bars exactly where you need them and hit a stud. You can't rely on toggle bolts, which only hold 30 pounds. Hmm, I guess that explains why the towel bars never stayed up in my kid's bathroom. Ah, gymnastics lessons. To make our bathroom accessible for age in place, it's easy to add a purchased shower chair and grab bars. Side rails can be added to the toilet. In addition to bathrooms, kitchens can be made more functional for older cooks with ideas like having a spot to sit while doing meal prep. My mother kept a tall stool in her kitchen from the time she was in her mid-70s. Levered handles on doors or faucets are simple solutions when arthritis makes hands stiff. Another interesting idea is placing the dishwasher on a riser, kind of like we do washers and dryers now. That way, you don't have to bend over. The chapters on bathroom and kitchen accessibility have more suggestions. Be sure to check out the technology chapter. As soon as my, I convince my mother to talk to the Amazon Echo like she was commanding a bad dog, she was sold. Visitability and age in place are essentially off the rack designs. True accessibility is more of a custom made suit designed to perfectly fit 
one person. The disability could be a variety of different mobility issues from arthritis to total paralysis, or it could be visual or auditory. I am only going to be addressing mobility issues in this video. Our home is designed for visitability and age in place, so it's time to show you the real deal. Daniel's house, which is a five minute drive from us. But before you meet him, I'll tell you a little about him. When Daniel was in college, he broke his neck in a diving accident. There was no alcohol involved. It was a dislocation fracture of the third and fourth cervical vertebrae, meaning they stretched apart and became misaligned, causing permanent damage to his spinal cord, leaving him completely paralyzed from the shoulders down. He was hospitalized for four and a half months where, with the help of wonderful doctors and therapists, he regained the ability to breathe, eat, speak, and learn to drive a wheelchair. We learned how to provide all his care and teach future medical providers about his injury since few are familiar with this level of spinal cord injury. You're probably thinking, that's just horrible. Those poor people. It's okay. Remember, the most creative solutions and the best stories begin with the biggest challenges. Our family is very creative and has lots of stories. A quick story that tells you about how pragmatic and stubborn Daniel is. In the rehab hospital, a social worker told the patients about a federal program called vocational rehabilitation. People who have employment challenges because of injuries can get financial assistance with tuition and educational expenses. His response was, I hope they don't find a cure for spinal cord injuries until after I get out of school. I do not recommend breaking your neck to get a free education, but I will tell you that the young people in his law class had an average of $200,000 in school debt. Thanks to Boke Rehab and some wonderful scholarships, he had minimal debt. He now works as a securities lawyer in the D.C. area, and we're still waiting for a cure. Now, here's Daniel. Okay, Daniel, you want to introduce yourself or do you want me to do that? I guess you can introduce me. This is Daniel. He is the oldest of four and he has very strong leadership skills. Um, don't all first children. Um, he um, has always been a very positive, determined people that likes to solve problems. He was still in the hospital. It was about... Um, a few couple weeks before we left the hospital and it was in a kind of a quiet moment and he said you remember mom when they used to um, put blindfolds on us in elementary school and ask us to figure out how to do things and I said yeah I remember and do you remember what you said <laughs> he said I always like doing that and then he said you know this is kind of like that <laughs> so I think um, since he broke his neck he's always enjoyed the challenge of figuring out how to do things. Okay. <laughs> I think the most common question that you're asked is, how do you drive your chair? Uh, well, I drive my chair with this tube right here. And if I blow hard, it accelerates. If I suck hard, it decelerates. If I blow softly, it turns right, and if I suck softly, it turns left. I knew you had the answer to that question because I've heard that question asked yeah. uh, hundreds of times, right? That yeah. right? Oh, yeah. People <laughs> always want to know how that works. Yeah. Okay. Now, here's the next question I see asked. What's the second tube for? Uh, this second tube is uh, just an automatic door opener on my uh, back door of my house. <laughs> but that was kind of a life-changing moment when we realized there was an automatic door opener that was just available online. I don't remember it being terribly expensive. Um, we can link it below so people can see where that is. And it can be controlled with a, like a little remote control clicker 
or it has the option for a sip and puff, which is attached to his chair, and that's how he opens the door, which is really handy if, you know, if we're like eating outside or something and I have an arm full of stuff, Daniel, open the door, and he'll get the door for me. Um, so that's pretty handy. Daniel's house is a good example of using an entrance other than the front door. He goes in the back door. The previous owners were an elderly couple. When a large tree damaged the corner of the house, they used the insurance money to replace an old window with an accessible door. Daniel's driveway is steep, but his power chair can handle it as long as there's no snow. He has a large commercial doormat to clean off his wheels. The door has a bit of a bump coming in, so Daniel has added a very small ramp. With the electronic door opener and the lock controlled with his phone, he can independently come and go. This is the bathroom that inspired ours. It feels more spa-like than disabled person lives here. You know how cold it feels in the shower when the water's off? This arrangement allows him to stay under the water and also have the snake for rinsing off. The extended shelf off the back of the shower is extremely handy for all those bottles in the bathroom, as are the little command hooks on the wall. I will repeat, install large sections of wood securely when you're remodeling or framing any bathroom walls to easily put in grab bars. If you want a roll-in shower, the floor must be lowered so it can be sloped toward the drain. Daniel had an unfinished basement with wooden framing. Our shower was over a crawl space. We cut down the original floor joists and reinforced the area under the shower. In our Colorado home, we had to bring in the guys with the jackhammers because that bathroom was on concrete slab. If your bathroom is on the small size and you want a roll-in shower, make a wet room by tiling the entire bathroom and leaving the area open. The easiest way to create an accessible vanity is to measure the height needed to roll under and mount a pre-made one-piece vanity top to the wall using side supports with a spanning front support. This is where customization comes in. Wheelchairs are different heights. Daniel never used the vanity so decided to just pass on it and save money. If he ever changes his mind, he'll get one that he can easily roll under to reach the sink. If he wants something stylish, he can get one from Pottery Barn. Faucets should be levers easily turned with the back of the hand. That's helpful with arthritis and lower cervical injuries. Toilets come in different heights. A higher toilet with a grab bar is convenient for people with a range of mobility issues. Commercial toilets also include shorter ones, which could be used for little people or others who need lower facilities. And bidets with warm water can be added to an existing toilet, and they're readily available today and very handy. Toilets are easily switched out, so don't be intimidated. Daniel does not cook, so we've never had to make a kitchen accessible. I'm going to give you as many ideas as I know about. Your job is to select the ones that best suit your situation. The counter height is the first thing to start with. Again, measure the wheelchair or the height of the cook to determine the perfect height of the counters. If they're going to be multiple cooks, make sure each has an area with a comfortable working height. If the cook will be in a chair, keep the area under the sink and food prep areas or baking center open so knees and feet fit under. When selecting the right sink, there's so many options today. A seated cook might prefer a shallow sink or one with a built-in cutting board. Keep in mind, if there is more than one cook, it's not unusual to have a second prep sink in the kitchen these days. Adding a smaller sink does not have to be a huge expense. Then whoever gets the larger sink has to do the dishes. And talk about options. Consider all the faucets on the market now. 
You can use a lever or a wrist blade or touch activated. And I love having a pull down sprayer. Base cabinets can have drawers, including deep ones, pull out shelves or open shelves. The drawers can fully extend and have a self-closing feature. Consider a corner pull-out or a really good lazy Susan. A kitchen designer can help you with all the options. Upper cabinets can be outfitted with projects like Reva Shelf. A shout out to Charlotte, one of my viewers. They pull down and allow access for people who are seated or not six feet tall. This is handy for our stereotypical little old ladies and little old men. French door fridges are popular with everyone today. It's easier to open the doors and remove things from the freezer. Another option is refrigerator and freezer drawers. A pantry with shallow shelves makes it easier to see what's there. Consider whether a walk-in pantry is functional before you commit. Wall mount ovens placed at an optimal height with a door that tucks away and a pull-out cutting board under the oven make it easier to use the oven without getting burned or dropping things. There are smaller dishwashers on the market that are accessible, but they are smaller. You can also get pull-out drawer dishwashers or elevator standard dishwasher so you don't have to bend over as much. Consider a drop-down seat next to where you'll be working if you have a hard time standing. This is Daniel's dining area. Tables come in three common heights. Your standard dining table, a counter height, and a bar height. Since Daniel's chair is really tall, he has a bar height table. His was purchased off a church listserv over 10 years ago. I see them all the time at Costco with six chairs for close to the same price as a standard dining room table. At one point, Daniel used a regular desk in student housing and put cinder blocks under the legs to raise it up. At another point, he had a bistro table from Office Max to which he added a pull-out keyboard drawer. At work, Daniel uses desks on adjustable legs. But for Daniel, a desk just collected dust and clutter and took up floor space. He's been working from home since the beginning of COVID lockdown, so this is where he spends most of the day in his totally customized workspace. One of the first accommodations he asked for at work was a second computer screen. It was so handy, he said everyone else started asking for one. He then wanted the screen in his home office space to be mounted on the wall with the option to adjust it so he could even work from bed after he had surgery several years ago. At that point, he realized he didn't need a desk. So he eliminated everything that was not needed, added exactly what he wanted, and was left with this. You can see the two computer screens that are linked to his work laptop that has its own custom-made carrier. Thanks, Dad. He has a microphone on an adjustable boom, so it will be right by his mouth. Important since he uses voice-activated software, Dragon Legal. His friends were so impressed with how fast he could dictate that they wanted him to teach a class using it. He also has an iPad to monitor his exterior cameras and a light mounted on the wall. I remember when um, the Amazon Echoes first came out. It was kind of an early release, kind of limited access uh, program. So yeah, I got that very first one right away. And what things have you been able to do with an Amazon Echo? We are specifically not referring to her. We refer to her, her as she who must not be named because invariably if you say her name, things start happening. 
Um, but tell me about the things that you've done in your home, and then I'll let people know what they've done. In, you've done in my home. Uh, yeah, I've hooked up the Amazon Echo to uh, obviously all my lights, um, my thermostat, fans around the house, space heaters, uh, the TV, um, pretty much anything I can connect connected to all connected to. So just random switches here and there. Uh, my my laptop, uh, I'm able to turn on and off with that switch. Uh, attic fans, bathroom fans. Now, there are some other options that are available that you have not done. One of them I know of is window coverings. Yeah, um, I, I've done uh, automatic door locks and I can control those with the Amazon Echo, but I haven't done uh, window coverings and that's mostly just because um, those are expensive. Uh, I got I got all the lights, I've had all the light switches um, probably for five years now, I suppose. Mm -hmm. And they were a little bit pricey, I think they were probably 50, you know, 40 to $50 each for each light switch. But window coverings are like uh, well over $100 for um, the motorization of each window. So that uh, that adds up a lot faster when it's one of those devices where you maybe open it once in the morning and close it once in the evening. So, and, and you, you can, uh, a room is perfectly functional with the blinds open or shut, whereas you might not be able to function at all if the lights are off uh, in the evening. Okay, so there are, um, like I would assume built-in light fixtures that you have to invest in. But I know in my home, you've done my lamps. Um, and how does that work? Uh, I mean, really, really just the same way. Um, it's just a standard LED, LED light bulb. Um, they're pretty cheap. You probably get a smart bulb for under $10. Uh, and that'll just plug into a conventional um, the light fixture, whether that's in your ceiling or uh, in a lamp, and that's probably your cheapest way to go. Okay, now, um, Daniel did my living room and a light in my bedroom, the bedroom that I use now, but that Grandma had used before, before she died, and my mom absolutely loved it because she was a bit of a night owl, and um, she could stay up beyond when we did, and all of the lights were networked, and you have it in your house where you can say something like, you know, turn on movie, and it will be just just the lights you want for the perfect movie viewing experience, and it's got the dimness and the lights that you want, and it turn off the ones you don't want, or you have one that's like, I'm home, and it turns on all the lights in the house because you're home. Um, so that's really cool. What do you think is the best way to learn how to do that? When I did it, I had to, it was a very new feature, so I had to figure out how to do everything on my own, but Nowadays, um, there are tons of YouTube tutorials about how to how to program it. Okay, so I will link in the description below some of those tutorials, and, and you'll have to tell us which ones are your favorites. You also control your thermostat. Um, how does that work? Uh, well, I got um, the original Nest thermostat. That was probably the very first smart thermostat. And it still still works great. They have newer ones, unless it's expensive ones that do the same thing. But yeah, you can control um, whether or not it's providing heat or cool. You can control uh, the exact temperature, um, and it's work. Uh, it's been extremely reliable. It's uh, you know I've had that now for I don't know maybe six or seven years. I think that might have been my very first device getting a smart thermostat. I kind of remember that. Um, and you know how when you go into like a nursing home or facility with elderly people and they all have on sweaters in the middle of July and it's still a little warm in the place? Well, when you have a sedentary life like old people or like people with cervical injuries, um, you don't generate as much body heat because you're not moving and, and it's our muscles that create the heat in our bodies. So Daniel likes to keep his home a little bit warmer and he also does not have the ability to cool himself so he can't run around the house and get warm and he also can't fan himself and perspire and all those things the rest of us do to cool ourselves 
So the external control is very important for him. Um, so that's why some of the things that were really helpful were a fan. He has a little fan on his bed, a little, little teeny fan, so he can turn on his fan if he gets hot in the night and doesn't have to wake me up, which is really nice. I, I enjoyed it because I was living with him, what, six or seven years ago, and um, you started doing the fan even then, that long ago. And it was wonderful to not have to get up in the night and, and take blankets off and on, turn on the fan. We have a space heater. You can control the space heater. That's very, very mm -hmm. nice that he has a, a great deal more control of his own temperature now. Um, now, you also use your phone for some things. I, and I don't really know what you do with the phone. What do you do with your phone? Uh, well, everything is connected to my phone and the Amazon Echo, so I have multiple methods of controlling every device. So I can, uh, you know, use this stick to tap on my phone, I can use uh, voice control with the phone, uh, or I can use the Amazon Echoes to control every device. Yeah, for me it's really important to have redundancy, um, just because, I mean, te technology fails. The internet's going to go out and so then the Amazon Echo won't work or uh, you know your phone has some kind of issue and it's not working so you got to use the Amazon Echo or uh, there's some kind of glitch going on so you just have to manually uh, hit the switch on your phone so I like to have multiple um, methods of being able to control every device. Okay another thing I know that you do is you have a little wise cameras so you can see like when a taxi arrives or who's at your front door and then you can unlock the front door? Yeah, I guess I forgot to mention. I, so in addition to all the other devices I have hooked up to my Amazon Echo, I also have a series of uh, cameras and out, outdoor lights. Um, I often have taxis. That's how I get around everywhere. And um, Or I'll have food delivered and it's difficult for me to check um, you know, who's at the door or who's arriving or whether somebody's arrive and I can't really look out the window as easily as other people can or go outside and look as easily and quickly as other people can so mm -hmm. oftentimes check on I have some Amazon Echo devices I can use I have a tablet that I kind of can use as like a almost like a monitor in a security station you can just constantly be showing me all the cameras um, all the different camera views so I can see who's at the front door who's at, who's at the back or who's in the front and uh, uh, I can answer, you know, the video doorbell that way. So I, I have the same thing. I can use the Amazon Echo, a tablet, a computer, or my uh, phone to control all those devices and view them. Fortunately, Daniel's really good with tech. Um, my husband's good with tech. Me, I just enjoy the benefits of it. Um, but it's it's been a real life changer, a real source of independence for you to be able to control your environment so effectively. Now I know that there are other things you can have um, ovens and garage doors and you know, I, I don't know all kinds of things attached to it. I'm not even familiar with all of that but that's the sort of thing that a little research is, um, is very very helpful with and I, I can imagine these things. I, I know they are excellent for people with disabilities um, and I know that my mom, grandmom used them um, so they're wonderful for aging place. You do need to have somebody that will do your tech support. Whenever things didn't work, we would invite Daniel over. We'd feed him dinner, and um, he would be our tech support. And he would, every time something doesn't work, I'm like, Daniel, come over and fix these things. And he would always fix them for me. He still does fix them. He shows up and fixes them for me. So it's really handy. I appreciate that. And, and um, you know, it's great. Um, Daniel has done Amazon Echoes for everybody in the family, so the the nieces and nephews can call you and, and look at you and play video games with you. They, they'll they'll go online and play something and have um, the the Amazon Echo so they can see each other and talk. Mm -hmm. And so it's it's <laughs> it's a bit of a fun thing to do. And since we're living in different parts of the country, it's really been helpful. Yeah, thanks. Daniel also has one of those robotic vacuum cleaners but I forgot to ask him about it. He has all hardwood floors and less furniture than most people. He upgraded to a programmable vacuum 
so it would get stuck less often. He's moderately happy with it. In July, just two months ago, Pottery Barn rolled out a new line called Accessible Home. They have taken designs you can find other places and made them attractive. No more assisted living chic. My father had a chair that functioned like this one, helping him to stand, but there was only one style and a couple of fabric selections. I'm impressed with all of Pottery Barn's choices. I love this French-inspired table with the metal base and a marble top. Unfortunately, it's too short for Daniel, and they only have one height option that I see. The desk options are wonderful with adjustable heights. There have been adjustable queen-size beds for 25 years that I know of, but now there are attractive options for the frames. A C table would have been so nice for my mom when she preferred to sit in her comfy chair rather than come to the dining table. I also like these drop-down tables and desks. Check out the beautiful bathroom designs. Sinks, tilting mirrors, attractive grab bars that don't look like a public restroom. I have a link to the website in the description so you can check out their creative solutions. So how do you pay for it all? Some home modification expenses can be written off on your state and federal taxes. I am not an accountant or a tax attorney, but my understanding is that any medically necessary modifications prescribed by a doctor can be itemized. Plus, here's the big news. Some, not all, some states allow homeowners to write off modifications even without medical necessity. That allows homeowners to make their homes visitable or plan for age in place before it's needed. For example, in Virginia, my understanding is a homeowner can write off $5,000 worth of modifications each year. And a larger expenditure can be spread over seven years. So if you spend $35,000, you can write off $5,000 each year for the next seven years on your Virginia state taxes if you have done modifications that make your home accessible. I'm not sure about the documentation process. Remodeling a bathroom or redoing an entrance? <laughs> Be sure to include accessible features. Talk with a knowledgeable accountant in your state to find out about potential tax benefits at the state and federal level. It could make a huge difference. If the person needing the modification is disabled or elderly and has limited means, I included sources of possible funding in the description that you can print out. The next 60 seconds are technical. If the person needing the modification is disabled on SSI or SSDI and qualifies for Medicaid, there is a one-time option for home modifications. That sounds great, but there are a few things to know. First, the application process is cumbersome, and the wait time for approval is lengthy, like six months. After you have approval, the work can begin, but not before then. There is also a maximum dollar amount, so you really need to prioritize. The modifications can be made to a rental or the home of a parent or family member the person lives with. The homeowner's income is not a factor unless the owner is the person with the disability. After Daniel's accident, we tapped into just about everything. My Rotary Club built a wooden wheelchair ramp in our garage so Daniel could get in the house. My parents paid for an inexpensive lift that 
the people from church to help my husband to install. The philanthropic arm of our local builders association modified Daniel's bathroom. A friend I had done decorating with donated laminate wood flooring for Daniel's bedroom and two friends from church helped us to install it. After Daniel went back to college, he lived in student housing for the first three years. ADA required the university to have accessible housing. When he changed schools for more graduate work, undergrad housing at the university was the only choice, but not a good one at that school. We found a townhouse apartment community full of grad students in his program with visitable units that I mentioned earlier. ADA requires landlords to allow modifications for accessibility. The downside is the tenant can be required to escrow funds to return the rental property to its original condition. So essentially, you must pay for a remodel twice, up front, and the landlord gets to select the workmen who do the project. You can't just have volunteers. The landlord in North Carolina was a local man who probably owned a thousand units throughout the Durham area. I wrote him a letter describing Daniel's situation and what we needed to do and assured him that Daniel would be living there solidly for three years. An important consideration for a landlord in a college town. The man's response was an unbelievable blessing. First, he said we did not have to escrow funds to undo our modifications. He thought they would add value to his unit. Secondly, he donated a portion of the cost. And finally, his crew donated their labor. Our cost was minimal. We never met the man or even knew his name. There are so many good people out there. Don't be afraid to share your story or too proud to accept help when you need it. And remember to be generous with those in need. Don't be discouraged because the most creative solutions and the best stories begin with the biggest challenges. See you next time.